professor bijay yeah good evening to everybody i think i'll first of all thank the organizers for giving me opportunity and i if i think this is probably one of the odd uh, conferences where i am participating and uh, because most of the time i try to participate in uh, conferences which are pertaining to intervention it was uh, the request and a persistent request by rajiv charla who is my younger brother uh, to come and express my views about uh, does a diabetic patient behave the same way especially with reference to coronary artery disease so is my shared screen yeah put it in slide mode okay <clears throat> so uh, my task is to talk about uh, what if i have uh, coronary artery disease patients who are diabetics versus who are not diabetic well all of us know that uh, diabetes uh, is not only steadily i'll say it is uh, increasing its presence all over the globe so much so that in the last couple of decades is gone by 300% that's in us and i'm sure we'll have figures something like this maybe worse than that in india especially in the metropolitan cities like delhi and uh, i feel it has pandemic potentials to affect our life so something which has pandemic potentials and we know that uh, off late uh, nyha american heart society they were they used to usually talk about nyha class 1 2 3 4 but nowadays uh, for heart failure they are talking about uh, heart failure stage a b and c and d and stage a means if you have some risk and if if you are diabetic you have a risk to get into problem as far as heart is concerned so all diabetics that and uh, what i guess is about 50 crore people should be in the world having uh, diabetes so all diabetics are in a stage a heart failure and we know if you if you are diabetic you have some risk if you get atherosclerosis the risk is more and if with diabetes and atherosclerosis if you have had some ischemic event then your chances to get into trouble are pretty high so the magnitude of problem as we all understand is tremendous and we also know that uh, even though you cannot always have a full correlation of your metabolic uh, derangements with your vasculopathy but still majority of the patients as they have a deranged uh, metabolic profile in the form of blood sugars usually hba1c as they start climbing beyond 5 and 1/2 you start inviting problems and uh, typically it's a a1c around 8 to 9 when you start having problems much in excess of the population at large and uh, the disease as we used to think in the past was metabolic and we used to think about problems of diabetes used to be like hypoglycemia hyperglycemia hyperglycemia hyperglycemic uh, osmolar problems ketotic non ketotic problems but i think those were those were the things of past and they were addressing and they were talking about only a small part of the syndrome of diabetes where primary problem is vasculopathy which involves almost all arteries of body and uh, specifically kidneys and uh, not only vessels you also have affection of things which are in the vessel in the form of platelets and uh, not only the disease itself sometime the treatment especially in the form of insulin which also creates a problem uh, in diabetics and not necessarily every time it's a vasculopathy you also have a problem in the muscle itself because of metabolic problems so leading to myocardial dysfunction and the magnitude of uh, cardiovascular comorbidities in diabetics is almost 1/3 to 1/4 will have some kind of issues either silent atherosclerosis or they get into stable angina which gets into acss and uh, with unstable angina and myocardial infarction and subsequently get into uh, heart failure in fact if i look at my cath lab practice nearly one third and sometime if you are handling more complex cases nearly half of the patient will have diabetes in one form or the other and many of the patient who enter our cath lab uh, 
it's possible that they have never been diagnosed as uh, diabetic the odd blood sugar reading might be like 180 190 which many times the readings can be otherwise also in the absence of diabetes so many of the people who enter our cath lab they enter in cath lab without a fixed label of diabetes on them but that odd reading in the form of 180 190 of blood sugar which we which can be otherwise also means a lot of people can have hyperglycemia related to stress but what i mean is a significant proportion of patients who enter the cath lab without a label of diabetes even an odd reading of blood sugar high will often be reflecting that he has underlying diabetes <clears throat> now as we start handling these cases we start getting trouble right from the groin if you if i want to have an excess like i want to start my procedure from groin want to have a femoral femoral puncture diabetic patients are more likely to have a peripheral vascular disease and my problem will start from there only because if i want to ha have an excess with a bigger bore catheters or a bigger bore devices and nowadays we are using impella which is a, a device which is used for a lot of patients who have a poor ventricle and if you want to do a procedure i want that is cardiac function should be supported it is like is a it's like a left ventricular assist device which we put from the groin into the left ventricle and even if the patient's ejection fraction has gone down even during the procedure if he gets into a cardiac arrest still his circulation will be maintained i'll be able to do difficult cases so the moment i receive a patient who is a diabetic i get alerted because uh, not uncommonly they have associated peripheral vascular disease and taking these devices which are with big, big catheters it is at times difficult in diabetics and also if you keep these indwelling sheets in them then you invite problems and one of the important problems is poor wound, wound healing in these diabetics so if i receive a diabetic in the cath lab i think my problem will start from the groin excess itself also a lot of patients of diabetes who enter our cath lab many time we try to assess what is the ejection fraction and we know the ejection fraction can go down in diabetic because of various reasons uh, but here i like to just uh, emphasize that many of the patients who entered in our, in our cath lab with an ejection fraction of 60% which everybody considers is good good ventricle many of these ventricles may be significantly hypertrophied they might have significant fibrosis they are very poor to re relax and in fact we all know what is chronotropic bethmotropic ionotropy and these are all things related to heart as to how well the heart works but one more important tropy is leucotropy that means how well the ventricle relax and uh, a lot of patients who are diabetics will have ejection fraction of 60% so don't get carried away they might have a significant diastolic dysfunction and during the procedure itself while we are trying to handle these patient with coronary artery disease they have a pretty higher chance to flood their lungs and get into pulmonary edema so we don't get carried away by an ejection fraction of 60% in a diabetic also we do most of the tasks on coronary artery disease with contrast and contrast nephropathy is a special issue which is there with lot of patients who have an underlying renal involvement but if the renal involvement is because of diabetes then my ears have to be alerted because for the same degree of gfr if the etiology is something different then these people will tolerate contrast very easily on the contrary if the etiology for a low gfr is diabetes then they are much more prone much more vulnerable to get marked worsening of the uh, renal dysfunction after exposure to contrast in fact uh, roxana mehran has given a system by which we can predict as to possibly who is the one who is going to get into contrast induced nephropathy and if you look at it uh, diabetes is given three marks and a large number of diabetic patients are elderly are in heart failure and they also have an underlying creatinine on the heart side so the moment i know that this patient is diabetic even if the creatinine is let's say 0.9 or 1 i will be alerted because uh somebody who has a creatinine of 1 apparently a lot of physicians and lot of my colleagues will think that his kidneys are working okay but somebody donates one kidney loses 50% of gfr next day if you look at uh, urea and creatinine they will be okay so even despite the fact you have your gfr has come down to 50% still 
your creatinine will be okay your urea will be okay and many time the perception by physician is well kidneys are working fine i'll say even if it is creatinine is one and if a patient is diabetic i'll try to handle this patient as if he's in ckd because and i have to be very very careful about contrast try to limit the contrast as far as possible and try to use all other methods on on this earth which can be used to limit the quantum of contrast and many of these methods nowadays are in the form of intravascular imaging and try trying to do hemodynamic assessments within the coronary arteries by floating and vas which can tell me pressures proximal and distal to the lesion nowadays we call them ffr and ifr so i'll try to use all those methodologies so that i can limit the quantum of contrast as far as possible in a diabetic patient even if the creatinine is normal we also know that uh, diabetic patients as far as their coronary artery atherosclerotic lesions are concerned these lesions are far more complex than in non diabetic patients they have huge amount of necrotic core they have lot of inflammatory infiltrates and they also have a lot of calcium and these three things make the life of an interventionist hell whereas calcium will not budge will require lot of hardware to uh, say grind the calcium or break the calcium whereas on the other hand soft lesions will have lot of necrotic core and the moment you inflate a balloon these people have a tendency to go into slow flow and get into marked ischemia despite the fact we open the artery and put stents there and these are much more common in diabetics so we have to be alerted in diabetics even if the lesions are soft of course if the lesions are hard because calcification is more often in them we'll have to use different tools to handle calcium <clears throat> even after we have done pcis and if the angioplasty has been done very well the result was excellent if you follow up these patients they have a much higher chance to die after the procedure either they get heart attacks or they get uh, heart attack related to the stented segment or or segments other than the stented part because they have a atherosclerosis which is uh, more malignant than in non diabetic patients and that malignant atherosclerosis in the form of uh, diffuse atherosclerosis and lot of atheroma burden and some of these patient might have even negative remodeling like a 3 mm vessel which is looking three elsewhere it is possible that in a diabetic this 3 vessel 3 mm vessel is actually not three and it is like 2.25 or 2.5 and if you inflate a 3 mm balloon or put a 3 mm stand these arteries can perforate so we'll have to heavily rely on methodologies other than simple angiograms in the form of intravascular ultrasound while handling these diabetic patients and many of them have a lot of prothrombotic states which which makes our life very difficult <clears throat> and to handle that we usually give antiplatelets of different varieties we have nowadays new antiplatelets about 40% of the diabetics they have some kind of resistance to these antiplatelets so our life is pretty difficult while we are handling diabetics and uh, especially if you, if the diabetic is the one who is taking insulin then we see that the things are much worse than those who are not requiring insulin and we know that uh, diabetes affects uh, our cardiovascular system especially coronary arteries because of these various uh, uh, say various mechanisms but one of the most important mechanism by which you have adverse uh, cardiovascular events is platelets which are unduly active they are very angry in diabetics they have a tendency to collect together and form thrombus excite uh, fibrin and let the red cells uh, get entangled into into those uh, fibrin uh, strands and thereby forming clots and thrombotic events now the question is which antiplatelet i should be using if i am treating a uh, diabetic with coronary artery disease well often most of our patients are on clopidogrel but clopidogrel as i told you about 40% patients might be having some kind of resistance to clopidogrel especially if they are diabetic uh, newer antiplatelets in the form of ticagrelor is found to be better but much more effective antiplatelet in the setting of diabetes is presugrel which has been tested in triton timi 38 trial and uh, in fact in this trial more than 3000 patients uh, with acs they were taken up and we see that uh, with clopidogrel the incidence of cv deaths and strokes are pretty high uh, 
it has been decreased significantly by 50% by use of placebo. Surprisingly, these diabetic populations tolerate this presugril far, far better than the other population. And the incidence of bleeding is more or less the same as is there with clopidogrel. So one take for all of us is that if you're dealing with a diabetic population, then if you want to calm down the platelets, I think uh, presugril is probably the drug of choice. Of course, we have some issues related to presugril. You can't give it to elderly people who are underweight. But other than elderly under, underweight, I think presugril is a drug of choice for me if I'm handling a diabetic patient. As far as ticagrelor is concerned, I think it is better, but probably it doesn't give as much advantage as is done by presugril. In fact, ticagrelor, if added to aspirin, in patients uh, who have had some problem in the past, even when we are not doing stenting, I think it is considered to be a, a good drug. And uh, what, what has been seen is that uh, in this Thymus trial, which was uh, which came up in the European Society of Cardiology, I think uh, three years ago, and Deepak Lal Bhatt had presented it. It showed that uh, ticagrelor, even without acute coronary syndrome, either even without PCS, if it is added to the prescription of pure aspirin in patients who are diabetic with atherosclerosis, it makes our uh, event rates much much less. So I think ticagrelor can be added to patients who are diabetics, even without stenting or ACS. And uh, of course, uh, if we look at the disadvantages, there are disadvantages in the form of uh, bleeds, but those bleeds are often not fatal bleed. In fact, commonly these patients will get a subdural hematoma, which can be often recognized and handled. So I think the takeaway from this trial, which is presented by Dr. Bhatt is that uh, even those patients who are not in ACS or not in not having stenting, I think uh, you can add uh, ticagrelor and maybe some smaller dose rather than 90 milligram. You can give 60 milligram dose. Now it, a step further to handle the thrombotic issues. In addition to antiplatelets, can we even add anticoagulants? Well, it looks pretty odd because. Uh, People get so much problem even with the antiplatelets. But off late, it has been seen in COMPASS trial that if you add uh, low dose uh, uh, newer anticoagulants in the form of rivaroxaban, then the effect which you get from aspirin is bettered by rivaroxaban. And in fact, if you have a combination of low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin, you get the best results. And uh, these results has been they have been seen that they are far more marked in diabetic than in non-diabetics. We also know that uh, if you are a diabetic, your chances to get into heart failure after an ACS are pretty high. About two third or, or three third three fourth patients have a tendency to get into heart failure, even if it's a diastolic heart failure, if they are a diabetic. And uh, I know for most of you, if you have to treat diabetes today and if there is any question of heart failure, we tend to rely on SGLT2 inhibitors, which I think uh, must have been talked about by various uh, speakers. But I'll also again like to say my nod my hand that uh, this is a situation after ACS, uh, I would like to add a SGLT2 inhibitors, no matter whether they are diabetic or not. Of course, if they are diabetic, they are going to get a dual benefit. Often there is a question about whether should you subject these patients who are diabetic, especially if they have a multivessel disease, left main disease, to surgery or angioplasty. Well, this debate will keep going on, but uh, there is a lot of observational data and a lot of randomized trials. And off late, uh, meta analysis, uh, especially with the newer second generation drug looting stents, I think uh, now things are more or less settled. All these patients can have a tremendous benefit uh, from stenting and it is not a must to send these patients to surgery. However, you should just balance out that if there is a diabetic with multivessel disease, if you are subjecting these patients for bypass surgery, there is an earlier chance of having a higher mortality and stroke if you are doing CVG. But if you are sending these patients for angioplasty, then your chances of dying or getting stroke will be less, but you will have to buy higher chances or higher incidence of 
repeat revascularization. So that means stenting if done, there is higher chance to get re-stenting, but the survival of these patients is going to be as good. In fact, survival, initial survival may be bad with surgery. And many of these patients can have stroke if you are subjecting them to surgery. In other words, most of the patients, even surgeons, if you ask them that you are a diabetic and do you want surgery or not, very often they will try to opt for stenting. This is because nowadays newer variety of stents, they have shown much better results than it was in the past. And most of the trials which have compared, they have compared with the older variety of stents. One more, one new stent which has come up is Abilumina stent, which has a, a drug which is on the stent. A stent is a jelly. So you can deliver drug only at some places. There will be areas in between where the drug is not delivered. So latest concept is that you put a drug on the balloon and also drug on the stent so that the whole arterial wall can be can be delivered a drug. This, and this abdominal stent, stent has a drug on it. It also has a balloon which also has a drug on it so that the whole of the arterial tree can be uniformly treated with the drug. Here is one example who had a multivessel disease and uh, this is just one vessel which I'm trying to show. And this vessel was uh, stented in different views. And finally, this was the result. This is a stent which is lying here. And the classical picture of all these stents is that somewhere five years down the line, these stents will be working very well. So uh, uh, my take is that uh, one of the days when people used to push all these patients with diabetes towards surgery. Nowadays, many of them can be handled without surgery. Nowadays, we are trying to handle much more difficult cases, many of the cases which are even rejected by surgeons. So these are known as chip population. And how do I handle my chip population if the patient is diabetic? I am very concerned about the contrast nephropathy. I'll try to be very careful about the hydration, both pre, intra and post procedure. And I'll, I'll be very much alerted to the A1C and I'll try to control it to a much better level, especially if the angioplasty can be timed unless... If angioplasty is an emergency angioplasty, of course, I don't have time to set it right. But otherwise, I'll try to have my patient in the cath lab with his A1C more towards 6-7 rather than towards 12-13. I also want to know about not only systolic ejection fraction, systolic LV function in the form of ejection fraction. I'll try to do some kind of uh, newer imaging modalities to assess the diastolic dysfunction in these uh, diabetic patients who are coming with complex uh, anatomy. And I'll try to use FFR, IFR, and intravascular ultrasound in these cases, which will help me in losing, using less and less amount of contrast. And I'll try to use stents with thin studs, limer stents, drug-coated balloon along with the drug-coated stents, and try to put them on potent antiplatelets for at least one year, maybe longer than that, and try to have very stringent control of lipids because... Despite a stringent control of lipid, diabetic population continues to have newer lesions and worsening of lesions. So that is my take on this uh, diabetic population why I'm trying to address. Uh, I think Thank you very much. Yeah, I feel like